Bunuel's career spanned six decades. His innovative filmmaking created some of the most original and shocking images ever put to film. A film by Bunuel is going to surprise me every five minutes. I'm amused by it, I'm challenged by it. He was one of the most extraordinary directors who ever lived. He went on longer than most directors ever do. Bunuel never made a film to explain something. What you see in the film, you see. He was born in 1900. He was always saying, as they say in, in Spanish, yo voy con el siglo. I'm going with the century. Buñuel's upbringing was very conventional in that he grew up in a well-to-do family in Calanda. He went to Zaragoza to school there. It was a Jesuit school. And I think that that was, that was constantly a, a, a point of reference for him throughout his, his life. Buñuel had a very Spanish sensibility, absolutely Spanish Catholic sensibility. He went to Madrid to, um, and, uh, to stay at the famous Residencia de Estudiantes, where he came across Lorca and, and Dali. Probably is the most important event in the whole history of uh, not even Spanish, but Hispanic culture, you know, the meeting of these three men. Not only did the early relationship between Bunuel, Lorca and Dali shape Spanish culture, it would also have a profound impact on all of their personal lives and careers. Bunuel told me many times that he felt attracted, that he felt that something, a certain invisible strength, was attracting him towards Paris. À cause du groupe surréaliste, je suis allé à Paris, je suis rentré dans le groupe et je dois beaucoup. Peut-être que une autre personne sans cette expérience surréaliste. In the 20s, when the, the group was uh, formed, they shared a deep disgust for the society, for the bourgeoisie, for all the bourgeois value, and, and a violent desire to find something else and to change the world. Bunuel's interest in surrealism dates from this period. The surrealists were hugely interested in Freud and the exploration of the unconscious. His first big success, at least in the art movie world, was Chien Andalou, which was a surrealist parable. This infamous film was a collaboration with his friend Salvador Dali. Written in just six days, Bunuel himself stars in the opening scene. The idea of a, a razor cutting through probably our, one of our most powerful objects in our, in our body certainly the object that I value the most, and I'm short-sighted, uh, is a horrible thought. And I, th I think that, on a visceral level, just gets everybody going, but they cannot forget it. La regla te refuser toute image qui pouvait avoir une explication rationnelle, ou des souvenirs, ou dû à la culture, c'est-à-dire toute image qui nous apparaissait, et nous la trouvions impressionnante, qui nous impressionnait, on l'acceptait sans discuter. They had uh, uh, invented this technique with Dali. It was the right of veto. One of the two uh, proposes an idea. The other one has three seconds, no more, to say yes or no. Why three seconds? It's to prevent uh, uh, you, your reason, to intervene. It was just to get a spontaneous reaction. It was just a very vibrant pair of minds applying themselves to a new medium, and they applied it with the artist's eye. It was received by the surrealistic group in Paris with 
yeah, they were enthusiastic, they were raving, because that was the perfect illustration of the surrealistic way to approach a certain form of expression. And this was done on a budget which was given to them by Buñuel's mother. She, she was in tears, really, that, uh, that her son was going to become a filmmaker and, uh, and not, as she had hoped, somebody who would make a career himself, for himself in a, in a worthier profession. With or without her support, Buñuel was making a name for himself and winning acclaim from his peers. His next film, Large Door, was financed by art enthusiast Charles de Noailles, who was so excited by the potential of the young Spaniard, he commissioned him to make it. Large Door was another collaboration with Dali. It's a story of amour fou, or of mad love. Mad love which takes you out of yourself, which gives you uh, the highest type of fulfillment in life, but at the same time, which is liable to make a fool of you. Bunuel was now being influenced by cinema from around the world. I was extremely interested in the way he was and all the surrealists were by the American slapstick comedy, by Chaplin, Keaton, uh, Laurel and Hardy, Harold Lloyd, uh, Ben Turpin, which is to me, it's one of the most beautiful period in, in the history of the films. Bunuel himself had written a piece about Buster Keaton. And I still remember the first phrase uh, was, uh, the Buster Keaton films are as beautiful as bathrooms. I have to be rather controversial here. I'm not a great fan of Large Door. I, I know it's an important film, and I understand what it was trying to achieve to a certain extent, but I didn't think it succeeded in, in impact in the way that Anshia Andalou did. This time, the focus is much more on attacking the church. He's attempting to make the audience face their own values and beliefs. During a screening of Large Door in Paris, the cinema was attacked by a French nationalist group. Ink was thrown at the screen and artworks were destroyed. Controversy and public outrage followed. The film was banned for 50 years. In 1932, Bunuel left the Surrealists. At the time, the group was becoming greatly divided by politics. That whole era for people that were artists in Spain and what they represented um, was a very, very damaging time, and they had to seek ways of dealing with their political position. People veered themselves towards the left-wing and communism because it was an ideology that, that was so clearly defined against what was the status quo. It is disputed as to whether or not he ever joined the Communist Party, but it's clear that Buñuel, uh, Buñuel's political tendencies were to the left. He never was... You know, uh, he never had a communist court to the party. It led to a breakdown in his relationship with his good friend and collaborator, Salvador Dali. Dali was furious with Bunuel for what he felt was an abandonment of the ideas they had once shared. Although Bunuel never deserted surrealism altogether, politics were his new priority, and his response was shown in the documentary Land Without Bread. We perceive a range of mountains. In their folds lie 52 villages with a total population of 8,000. Buñuel had uh, seen in a, in a very poor country in Spain where people were living in conditions of life which was, even in the, in the early 30s and even in Spain, extraordinary. This is a film which shows the backwardness of a remote region in Spain. And part of the point is obviously to expose the, the lack of resources and its underprivileged status. But it's a documentary which was really already directed. It was a certain elaboration of, uh, of the, the real life. In a deserted street, we come across this child. The child's throat and tonsils are terribly inflamed, but unfortunately, we can do nothing about it. Two days later, they told us that the child had died. 
However, the girl did not die and was just one of the many untruths in the documentary. Nevertheless, the film did inspire a debate. There is always a kind of detachment in Buñuel, um, what you might call a conceptual approach to problems of this kind. But always, I think, in Buñuel, there is compassion. The civil war that ravages Spain divides the West. Some see in General Franco's revolt a crusade against godless communism. Others see in it only the spread of fascism and dictatorship. On Franco's side, Nazi bombers and Italian troops. On the Republican side, red volunteers and Soviet support. I think the Civil War was a defining element in um, Bunuel's life. It shifted him away from the country that he loved and, and the, the culture he knew about. The war was horrific and a terrifying experience for Bunuel, who would lose close friends in the conflict, which would affect him for the rest of his life. The Civil War was such an event in, in any Spanish man or woman from that generation, it's very difficult to to speak in a few words about it. You know, it was really a big drama, a tragedy. But the main tragedy in Bunuel's life was the death of Lorca. He always said, Luis, that Lorca had opened the door for him, showing him that there was another world. He had met uh, Lorca four days before his death and told him, don't go there, don't go to Andalusia, don't go, it's dangerous. But it was Lorca's country, you know, he was from, born there and said, no, I'm going to... And Bunuel tried to prevent him to go, you know. When I was asking Luis why was he shot and he, was, he would answer me, you know, at this time people were screaming death to intelligence. I'm sure that he was thinking about uh, Lorca's death at least once a day. It was impossible for him to continue to work in Spain under the dictatorship and clearly um, had to go into exile. For a moment he was living peacefully in New York working at the Museum of Modern Art and then when uh, Dali uh, wrote in, in his book that uh, Vinuel was an atheist. The whole thing changed. Uh, Vinuel told me, I, one day I arrived at the office and my secretary was crying. I said, what, what happened to you? What, why, why do you cry? And she said to me, but didn't you read what Dali said about you? Bunuel began to think of Dali as somebody who was only interested in making money, uh, who had um, political affiliations or tendencies that didn't accord with his own. And so there was a, there was a falling out. At that time, it was impossible to work in America being an atheist. He had to dismiss, to quit the, 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 the museum, and then, for a few months, he was penniless. As World War II ripped Europe apart, Bunuel moved to Hollywood, but he struggled to find work to support his family. He began to feel isolated, and that he was losing his reputation as an artist. He longed to make his own films again, so when he was offered an opportunity in Mexico, he didn't have to think twice. Buñuel didn't have any particular natural affinity with, with Mexico before he ended up there. It's a country that speaks Spanish, and therefore it's easy for him to, to make films in his own native language. And so he begins to make what he calls his bread and butter films. And extraordinarily, um, Buñuel even makes a, a musical. But as he says in his autobiography, I made these films in order to be able to make the films that were more personal to me. He, you know, made low-budget Mexican movies. They were B-movies. And they're terrific, actually. They really are extraordinary, unusual and quite poetic films. The films that were to follow marked a new era for him. The films were shot in, in 18 days, Los Olvidados, for instance, less than three weeks, you know, less than a TV film today, you know, so, and very, very little money for him. Los Olvidados was his third or fourth uh, uh, Mexican film, but the one which really achieved international success. 
it was about Mexico City and the young people in Mexico City who had no chance, no power, no money, uh, and were in a desperate situation. One is called Pedro, and the other was called Il Jaibo. El Jaibo comes out of prison, determined to kill the person who snitched on him, and does so. It implicates Pedro, who is his friend, or sort of friend, associate in the gang. An absolutely unforgettable film in every way. The principal character is so sympathetically drawn and beautifully drawn, and the kids, the whole environment of the kids in that immensely impoverished area. That was shocking for people to see that. Some uh, groups, uh, prof, um, uh, professors and other groups in Mexico asked my expulsion from the country for making this picture. They were against the picture. ¿Ya no me regala un cigarrito? No mantengo vagos. What Bruno was, was saying was, it's no use sentimentalizing the poor. They're there because of society's lax, but they're brutes, and they've been made brutes by society. The other thing that you, remember, you have to remember about Los Salvadores is not only that social angle, but also he pushes in dream sequences, which are completely unlike anything else that had been made previously. Now, this scene can be read in a multitude of different ways. It obviously has Oedipal significance. It has been read by other critics as a, as a statement about the, the hunger of Latin America, all of which makes, for me, Los Olvidados, a, a spectacularly interesting film. Because of the Civil War and then the Second World War, I was obliged to stop making film for almost 15 years. So when, again, he could make films in Mexico after the end of the war. He was already 45. You know, he was already a man of a certain experience, you know. That's quite important, you know. And probably that, that's the reason why he made in very interesting films. It was taken to Cannes. It won him the Best Director Prize. He was 50 at the time, not exactly a young man, when he had his first big international success. That put him on the map and the films that subsequently came out, which in some ways didn't top it, but they certainly equaled it in terms of their impact, gave him a status within the industry which was huge. It was in his more personal Mexican films that Bunuel would tackle religion more directly. It became a theme he would explore for the rest of his career. I am a pupil of the Jesuits for eight years when I was a young man. Then I know very, pretty well the religion, the Catholic uh, religion. People that have such powerful Catholic backgrounds can never, ever get rid of them. And so although you proclaim atheism, uh, you still have ingrained in you a certain emotional context, philosophical context that comes from your background. Catholicism attracted him in certain ways. He could never actually leave the church entirely. The interesting thing about Bumbo is he also made films that were deeply personal films that actually really dealt with the whole question of Catholicism in a specific way. Padre Nazario. Hola, Beatriz. Se me hace un milagro encontrarlo, Padre. ¿Por qué, hija? El mundo es muy grande. ¿Qué desgracia le fue a pasar que se ve así? Ando de peregrino. Descalzo. Dormí esta noche con una familia de pobrecitos y le di mis botas al más viejo, que estaba enfermo. Nazarene was another of Bunuel's Mexican films. It's about a priest who was a very good man. He goes around Mexico dealing with the poor, dealing with the dying. Everything he does uh, is, is charitable and honorable. And everything he does fails dismally. Support the 
tus sufrimientos y prepara tu alma al gozo que te espera de verte en la presencia de Dios. Cielo. Juan. Deja ya las pasiones de este mundo, hija. El Señor te da tiempo para ser examen de conciencia. Piensa en el cielo que te espera. Oh, cielo. And it showed uh, his anti-religious feelings absolutely spot on. You've never seen uh, a film in which it was better expressed the fact that he was educated by the Jesuits and actually, although sort of admiring them, also rejected them. Bunimo goes on about mystery all the time in, in his writing about film. He's interested in, as in his fascination with dreams, he, he loves the, the opaqueness, the mystery of life. The famous statement that he made, as everyone knows, is, um, I am an atheist, thank God. I accept that it can be many interpretations, but my idea was to show that this man, who is perfect, is a block, uh, he arrives to doubt. For me, the doubt is very important in the life. Yo no hago más que maldades y... Pues, su vida, ¿para qué sirve? Usted para el lado bueno y yo para el lado malo. Ninguno de los dos servimos para nada. You know, Binuel was a, a man of uh, a certain number of uh, contradictions. He was from a bourgeois origin and totally subversive. It was from a very Catholic education and totally atheist. He was purely Spanish and even from a certain country of Spain, Aragon, and in the same time universal. You know, it was a surrealistic filmmaker, but ending up with very well-built script. You know, all of this, it's a mixture, like any great uh, artist, of contradiction that you cannot explain. That he was living at his, in the middle of these contradictions, that maybe for some other people would be unbearable. He leads a pretty conventional life. But of course, uh, what he represses in his private life returns in the films that he makes. And the, the films are a kind of uh, explosion of all of that uh, repression. Senza fine, tu trascini la nostra vita. Senza un attimo di respiro per sognare, per poter ricordare. Ridion is another of his Mexican films, um, which was an international success, long after Los Olvidados. A young and beautiful Navisha trainee nun pitches up at her uncle's and he falls in love and tries to seduce her, drugs her, then doesn't rape her, and then when it's discovered that that's all been going on and she leaves, he hangs himself. I mean, that alone is... Powerful stuff. You'd never get into a movie nowadays. Antes de irte, tienes que oírme. Ya le oí bastante. Déjeme salir. Todo lo que te dije es mentira. Lo dije para que no te fueras. Solo te ofendí con el pensamiento. No puedo resistir que te marches odiándome así. She decides that she'll instead of becoming a nun in the orthodox way, she'll look after a group of poor people. They, too, make mincemeat of her in every way. It's a film about charity, or, or the, the sort of double-sidedness of charity. She turns the house into a refuge for beggars. But charity on its own is simply not going to be sufficient to change society. The very people whom Viridiana, through her act of charity, has invited into the house, turn out to be killers uh, and uh, rapists and uh, liars and cheats. And so the uncle has destroyed part of her faith and the poor people later have destroyed most of the rest of her faith. He's always funny. There's always really comic touches in it. And even when it's at its most macabre, there's something amusing there. And he had that sort of special ability to make people laugh. Viridiana is one of the high spots of Buñuel's film career. It 
was an attempt by Spanish filmmakers at that time to bring Buñuel back to Spain and to see whether they could kind of reintegrate him in the Spanish movie industry. But of course, um, it scandalizes the, um, the authorities and um, he's sent packing. <laughs> At one point, when he was 63, he met Serge Silverman, which was an important, very important encounter in his life. And Serge Silverman offered him to make a film decently paid with Jean Moreau, good actors, in France. And Louis uh, proposed to make the diary of a chambermaid. Ah, it's a very good film. Vous feriez mieux de penser à autre chose. Oui, vous feriez bien mieux. Je le répète. Pensez ce que vous voudrez, mais vous et moi, nous sommes pareils. Nos deux âmes sont pareilles. He himself says that he thinks his best films were the films that he made in his late period. They have a kind of fluency, uh, a, um, a polished look, and they use um, mainstream stars, Catherine Deneuve, of course, and he retains Fernando Rey in, in quite a few of those films as well. Jean-Claude Carrière would also become a frequent collaborator with Bunuel during this time. I did a certain calculation that uh, we ate together, the two of us, only the two of us, more than 2,000 times which is more than many couples, you know, could say, you know, was in. Every day we had a rule, like a law, very uh, tough to follow. At the end of the day, after a long, long work of six, seven hours of working together, we would uh, uh, part for half an hour. In this half an hour, we were obliged to find an idea for a film or for a scene in relation with the script or not. And then, we would meet at seven o'clock in the bar, and then we would be obliged to tell our story to the other. It was like a training for the mind. Working with Benoit is like finding yourself at the final of the Olympic Games, and there is nothing above. So you have to be, you know, as, as well trained as, as possible. In 1967, they made the film that would prove to be one of the most successful in Benoit's career, Belle de Jour. Je t'aime chaque jour davantage. Moi aussi, Pierre. Je n'ai que toi au monde. Uh, absolute favorite of mine. I've seen that four or five times and I love it every time I see it. Pierre, je t'en supplie. Je te demande pardon, Pierre. De tout mon cœur. First sequence of that film is incredible because you see Catherine Deneuve being tied up to a tree and then whipped. And then you understand that what you're about to be dealing with is um, a woman who is married in a, in a strange conventional marriage who decides that what she's going to do is live the life of a prostitute. À quoi penses-tu, Séverine? À quoi penses-tu? Je pensais à toi. And I received a letter from Binwell saying that he had been offered to adapt the Belle de Jour, the Joseph uh, Kessel novel. And Rimal told me, but that's a very bad novel, he shouldn't do that. We have all refused. You know. Yes, I said, but there was some phrases in the letter from Luis that, you know, gave me the feeling that that could be an interesting film. Belle de Jour characteristically blurs the boundaries between dream, daydream, hallucination, and reality. Bunuel feels that there is no distinction to be made between these different levels of reality. The confusion of these different levels, the overlaps between these different levels, is what interests him. Avec ça? Oui. Qu'est-ce qu'ils font? Oh, rien. Ils s'amusent. Vous voulez un coup d'œil? It was not Silberman, the producer. There was the Akim brothers, very commercial producers, and they produced the film without knowing at all what they were making. They thought it was a story of uh, prostitutes, you know, very commercial, which the film was not at all. 
It's an erotic film, there's no doubt about that. Everybody thought it was incredibly daring. But it hasn't got a lot of erotica in it. There are a few bits and pieces, but it's not a sex film. Craché, piétinez-moi la figure. Espèce de saligo, vieux cochon. She, at one point, looks through the keyhole at somebody else, another prostitute, with, uh, with one of her customers. And she looks at it and she says, how disgusting. But, of course, she does exactly the same thing. So there's a part of the bourgeois is always in her. Alors, vous avez bien vu? Qu'est-ce que vous en dites? Comment va-t-on descendre aussi bas? Vous avez sans doute l'habitude, mais moi, ça me répugne. Belle de Jeu was a massive hit and took Catherine Deneuve into a different arena as far as what her status was internationally as an actress. Moi aussi, cet homme-là, il me ferait peur. Des fois, ce doit être pénible tout de même. Qu'est-ce que tu en sais, Palace? Belle de Jour had won the, the Golden Lion in the Venice Film Festival. And Bill Welch was now quite famous, known. After that, Silberman offered Bill Welch to, to make whatever he wanted. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Il y a un champ de tir par ici? Non, 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 c'est moi. Je, je m'imaginais qu'on fusillait un pape. Comment? Ouh, rassurez-vous, vous verrez beaucoup de choses. Mais le pape fusillé, ça, vous ne le verrez jamais. Bunuel continued writing with Carrière in Mexico and filmed in France and Spain, often announcing that the film he was working on would be his last. Je n'aime pas beaucoup plus travailler. Je suis un travailleur extraordinaire pour le shifter. Je suis capable de passer des mois sans rien faire et je voudrais déjà finir sans rien faire. Mais je ne sais pas. He was allowed completely free hand bigger budgets than the Mexicans ever gave him. He began to loosen the narrative of his films, not worry about orthodox plots, and do exactly what he liked. One of them was called The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, in which six bourgeois attempt throughout the film to have dinner with each other. But it never works out. Bonsoir, chère Alice. Don Raphaël, comment allez-vous Très bien. Et je suis ravie de vous revoir. Merci. Alice. Bonsoir. Quelle surprise Si je m'attendais à vous voir ce soir... Vous ne nous attendiez pas Ah non, pas ce soir. Pas ce soir Non. Je vous attendais demain, comme prévu. Demain Oui. Mais Harry nous avait invité pour ce soir. J'en suis sûr. We had uh, absolutely no starting point, but one word, and the word was repetition. Pinuel liked very much this idea. Uh, already in the, if you see the beginning of the exterminating angel, there are two people who meet, the two people, and introduce themselves to each other twice. Cristiano Galde, encantado, igual. ¿Me permite? Naturalmente, doctor. Leandro, querido amigo Cristian. Amigo, qué alegría. Los creía como siempre en Nueva York. An action that repeats itself. Pinuel you know, liked very much this idea. We finally, we found the idea of some friends. They want to eat together and they cannot. That's the, that was the main and the very simple idea at the very beginning. Mesdames, Messieurs, bonsoir. Veuillez nous excuser. Mais que se passe-t-il Je ne vous attendais que demain. Les manœuvres ont été avancées d'un jour. Mais colonel, vous vous rendez compte Vous arrivez à l'improviste et je... Ah, je suis sincèrement désolé. Croyez bien que ce n'est pas ma faute. To make a film in your 70s that absolutely and utterly encapsulates bourgeois life in the world generally and also, in the, to a certain extent, satirizes a life that he knew about is extraordinary. Um, and you've got dream sequences in that. I mean, it's full of outrageously funny things throughout the film. Qu'est-ce que tu fais Raphaël pose ce fusil, qu'est-ce qu'il te prend Laisse-moi, je sais ce que je fais. It goes to all sorts of surreal dream sequences um, and strange happenings, which are not very easily explained, but it is so fluid and so beautifully shot and so beautifully acted 
and so beautifully together as a film that even though you don't understand a lot of it, and I certainly don't understand all of it, uh, it's a masterpiece of its kind. <laughs> The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie is probably Buñuel's most complex dream film. There's a wonderful sequence um, in the film where one of the characters dreams that another character is dreaming. Mon Dieu, mais qu'est-ce que je fais ici, moi? Vous avez endormi avec un narcotique. Je ne connais pas le texte. hated bourgeois respectability, which he saw a lot of it in himself. He realized he was part of the bourgeoisie, part of this extraordinary and ridiculous culture. And that's perhaps what made him so powerful in attacking it. In 1977, at the age of 77, Bunuel finally released his last film, That Obscure Object of Desire. Such an investment making a film, emotionally and practically, and and you know you you, you make a film and you're, you're just sort of exhausted for about two weeks, and then you think, hold on a minute, I've got some other idea I want to engage in, and I'm quite sure that's how he operated, and um, his relationship with Carrier must have been very fruitful in that sense. Ça veut dire, quelqu'un nous écoute, non? Tu veux que je te dise, dis? Tu as un autre amant, non? Tu veux que je le sois, oui. Et c'est vrai C'est une chanson. Les paroles ne sont pas de moi. Je pense à vous tout le temps. Moi aussi. The obscure object of desire for this elderly Spanish gentleman, Fernando Rey, a wonderful performance. It was never there. And actually, it's never there in the film because the obscure object of desire are two women, not one playing the same character, which will puzzle us even further, and certainly puzzle Fernando Rey. The younger woman was originally to be a part played by Maria Schneider, but she had various problems uh, once the, the shooting got underway, and she had to be relieved. So two other actresses uh, were suggested to Buñuel, Angela Molina, the Spanish actress, and also Carole Bouquet from France. And typical of Buñuel, when asked which of these two would you prefer, he said, well, let's have them both. It was a kind of wonderful um, um, moment of inspiration. Oh, ta peau est douce. Et ton ventre. Mais qu'est-ce que c'est que ça? Quoi? Ce que je sens là. Qu'est-ce que tu portes? That obscure object of desire, I think, returns to the question of Amour fou. It's there in L'Age d'Or, it's there in uh, Chien Andalou, and it's still there in that obscure object of desire, the very last film that he made. Tu sais, Mathieu, ce que je fais, moi non plus, je ne l'aime pas. Et toi, ce que tu aimes, c'est ce que je te refuse. Ce n'est pas moi. This is a story of Amour fou by an older man for a younger woman and in some ways, of course, uh, must be seen to reflect Buñuel's own life. By now he's 77 and puts into Fernando Rey the feelings of the older man for the younger woman and the love-hate relationship that then develops between Fernando Rey and the Conchita part. When they're together, they can't live with each other. When they're apart, they can't live apart. Et le Parti communiste lui-même a publié un texte qui condamne vigoureusement le vieux attentat. Et maintenant, pour nous changer un peu les idées, cédons la place à la musique. When he shot this film at the end of, uh, he, he was not happy with the result, so he made a retake of the close-up of the two I knew because they were the hands of my wife. The last shot he has ever shot. I know it was the last, of course. But the whole uh, opus of, of Benoit, the whole work, is between a razor that cuts a knife and two women's hands which repair.
Bunuel died aged 83, leaving a unique legacy. He's one of the most famous directors in the world, one of the most admired directors in the world, and one who age certainly didn't seem to wither at all. The films remain thought-provoking, fascinating explorations of the issues and concerns that we're all of us interested in. Love, death, sexual relations, identity, human injustice, political corruption. He was maybe one of the dozen great directors in the 20th century and influence anybody who sees that work in some form or another, and in particular, influence the way that other artists go about doing what they do. In that sense, that's a huge legacy.